Welcome to FireSafe Marin's webinar series. My name is Rich Shortall, the FireSafe Marin Executive Coordinator. Our wildfire season is not over. We recently experienced multiple red flag warning days and several Bay Area counties have endured public safety power shutoffs. We are constantly reminded they're living with the threat of wildfire. Tonight, you will learn how wildfires spread and more importantly, which wildfire dynamics you can control. The Fire Safe Marin webinar series is created by members of our educational committee, including representatives from fire agencies, environmental groups, UC Marin master gardeners, and various subject matter experts. The project is funded and supported by the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. It's designed to help you understand and prepare for the threat of wildfire here in Marin. If we all do our part, we can minimize risks and save lives and property. Tonight's presentation is the first in a series of six webinars that will cover wildfire behavior, defensible space, fire smart landscaping, and home hardening. Please visit the FireSafe Marin website and subscribe to our newsletter for more information about the program. This is not a lecture series. We encourage you to participate by providing questions in writing through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We expect a high number of attendees, so questions that cannot be addressed during tonight's conversation will be answered and posted on the FireSafe Marin website. We ask that you please keep your questions related to our topic. Tonight's presentation will be recorded and available on the FireSafe Marin YouTube channel, which includes many additional wildfire educational videos. Tonight, we will first hear from Jana Balakovic, a UC Cooperative Extension Forest Advisor. She will be discussing the influence of weather and topography on fire spread and how creating defensible space can protect your home. She will later be joined by Steve Quarles, UC Cooperative Extension Advisor Emeritus. Together, they will introduce the topic of home hardening, a topic that will be covered more extensively in future FireSafe Marin webinars. We will conclude the webinar with some suggested actions that you can take right now that will help make yourself safer in the event of a wildfire. And following the webinar, we have an additional 30 minutes of questions and answers for all of our panelists. Let's begin with a short video. On Rancho Santa Fe, on Via de Santa Fe in La Granada, there was a slight orange glow behind me. You actually can't see it now. It's died down significantly in the past hour, but the winds have kind of been picking up in the last few minutes or so, and that's what crews here are worried about. They've been cutting down trees in this area, hoping it doesn't spread into downtown. Now, that's some of that video that we shot earlier. That's taken actually of Via de Santa Fe and Via de la Valle, where at least three homes were on fire. Now, these burning embers just filled the sky. It looked like a rainstorm of fire and ash. And firefighters say the big problem in that area are the palm trees because, you know, they go up very quickly. The embers spread to other areas, and they say that's how this particular fire started um, from flying embers nearby. They have been here all morning long working on kind of these hot spots. Again, they want to, want to prevent it from moving downtown because there are a lot of old buildings in this area. Now, I did talk to some sheriff's deputies that were patrolling the area. Although everyone should be out and evacuated from this immediate area, they say a lot of people are still at home. They're knocking on doors, going door to door, and they're finding that people are in bed, just kind of unaware of what's going on. So again, if you are in this area, you definitely should not be here at this point. And we will be here because we're kind of monitoring the situation. At first, we thought it was actually going to cross over behind us. But like I mentioned, they have been cutting down a lot of trees in this area. Now, here's what a fire crew had to say earlier this morning. I uh, just found out, uh, or just heard, that I believe we lost a house down here on Lost uh, Calise. Uh, they're going in there now, but it sounds like they, they do have a uh, house on fire in there. So um, all these little things are popping up, and you know, all we can do is hit and run and hit and run. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Diana Valakovic, and I get to be one of your speakers tonight, and I'm looking forward to this program. So just a little bit of background. I work in policy and fire and forest education throughout California, though my primary home is in the North Coast up in Humboldt and Del Norte County. Uh, and I work at many scales. I work in prescribed fire. I work in specific uh, elements related to fire and forest resiliency and um, 
I've had the great pleasure to be mentored by um, Dr. Steve Quarles, who will be with us uh, in a bit tonight. And he's one of the premier experts on you know, developing and researching these elements associated with the home and how we can actually better adapt uh, to make our homes and our homes environments um, more resilient. So what we've got designed for you tonight is a, um, what we hope to be interactive. Um, we've got some, you know, slideshows that are going to come back and forth, and then uh, we're going to be able to um, talk about a variety of issues. And so I just want to, you know, give you some thought about what we're going to do. Um, and then a little, you know, personal story. I lived in Oakland during the 1992 Oakland Hills fire. Um, and it brought back memories from the wildfire that my father actually ignited. I grew up in rural Northern California and he um, unintentionally started a wildfire with a weed whacker using a metal blade, um, trying to get efficient and get in front of it and um, did what so many of us think isn't possible, uh, you know, hit a rock and all of a sudden we had a conflagration that burned a couple of my neighbor's homes down. I was the only person home. And so I think I got the fire bug um, started at that point in terms of trying to think about what we could do, what we could do differently and, and how we could be better prepared. So this is, as Rich said at the beginning, um, a series that's going to focus on the home and uh, defensible space. And not everything I'm going to talk about now is going to be covered uh, tonight, but what we're really trying to do is inspire action and inspire individual actions, uh, both in rural, suburban and urban settings as well as community actions. And, you know, what can we do to help each other? How can we lift each other when we're, um, you know, so focused on all these other things that are driving at us? I mean, I know that the acute issues of COVID and all these other things, you know, take precedent. And how do we even just get our, you know, our children's educations uh, accomplished in this moment? But um, fire is something where we really need to figure out how we can lift everybody and how we can work together. So tonight we're gonna to talk about fire exposures and then we're gonna hint at some of the home hardening elements um, and uh, you know, start to hint at some of the simple retrofitting strategies that people can do, uh, and then some of the new best practices for new construction. Um, we're gonna talk more about defensible space as well as prioritization. And you know, it takes a little while to begin to get into these issues. And you know, I think that video, um, it, it refers to uh, a fire that is sort of uh, appropriately named since we're bearing down on Halloween. It was called the Witch Fire. Uh, and that was done, uh, that fire um, was in 2007 in Rancho Santa Fe in San Diego. And what I like about that video is it really illustrates wind, embers. Uh, the embers are almost like a locust storm, aren't they? I mean, they're just, you know, everywhere. They're saturating the environment. And, you know, that um, starts igniting other trees, and then those trees start creating embers, and you just really get the sense of this sort of cascading set of issues that come forward when you have wildfire. And I, I know folks that are watching this, you know, have experienced a tremendous amount of exposures in the last several years and, and experiences that people don't ever want to repeat. So how can we think about um, these issues and how does that video sort of set the context about how um, wildfires burn in the wildland urban interface and how they can move into more urban settings and what does that mean for us overall? So as I, as I think about this issue um, and, you know, as I say, I work at many scales, people ask me this generic question, and I think you can apply it to almost any issue right now, but how do we fix it? You know, what's it going to take for us to get out of this place? I mean, we've just gone through power shutoffs. We just uh, are experiencing another wind event. Um, we've had, you know, record-setting numbers of acres of uh, fire this year. We keep, you know, breaking records in terms of numbers of homes that have been exposed and numbers of homes that are ignited because of fire. So what can we do? And so I have a rather complicated slide here um, that I want to talk about turning the dials, turning the dials to create resiliency. You know, California is a Mediterranean climate um, where the vegetation is both adapted and dependent upon wildfire. So what does that mean? Well, we've built our cities, our towns, our cabins in the middle of this environment that was set up to burn. And that uh, those fires were both ignited by 
lightning as well as by humans. And the Native Americans used fire as a really important tool for the maintenance of their landscapes, for the preservation of their food sources, for the control of insects, uh, for the creation of lush materials for basketry. And we shut that process off uh, by our fear and our risk and our concern for fire, which appropriately so. But now we're in a place where we have to figure out how to make change. And so I just use this uh, image here to sort of illustrate how many dials need to be turned, how much room there is for improvement. You know, and you'll see, like, we're talking about being in a red flag warning right now. So we're making big advances in weather, weather forecasting. Alert system, getting better, still got, room to, still got room to grow, right? What about fire response and evacuation? The idea that we have a mutual aid system and we've got neighborhood scale planning and we've got drills and we're practicing. Yeah, we're making some progress there. And, you know, Marin uh, is one of the few places where I've actually heard of real evacuation trials. And what a great thing, because the moment you know, you've got wildfire burning and drilling down on you, it's the moment that I usually lose my brain and I can't think. And so you have to make these actions routine so that it's possible to, to move forward and not, not get paralyzed in that moment. But when it comes to wildfire, we spent most of our time talking about wildland management and what you can do to the wildland and that's fuels reduction and maybe that's prescribed fire and, and there's a role for a viable wood product industry to be able to process those low value, um, low commercial you know, materials that have to go somewhere. Uh, but we're also coming to recognize that the value of open space in agriculture is maybe something that we've discounted because it provides buffers and safe zones. And when you start thinking strategically about how all those pieces come together and how important that agriculture is to protecting our communities, it starts to, you know, the, the dials start to go, the, the ideas start to spin in my mind. But we also recognize that infrastructure, you know, our utilities, our water, our hospital, all those need some extra special work so that we don't contaminate them, so that we can protect them, so that they can function in our moment when we need them most. We've got a lot of effort around land use and planning and building codes and zoning. And, you know, there's fierce debates about that issue in California. But you can see how these, piece, these pieces start to fit together and how we have to break down the silos and how we have to work on these issues, you know, 12 months a year. It's not just when there's smoke in the air. It's not just when the winds are intense and the humidities are low. These are, this is a subject that moves from, you know, an acute to chronic, in and out, back and forth, where we actually need to put all hands on deck and figure out how we work within our vocabularies, work within our response capacities, and figure out how we do real and effective planning and can make real tangible actions at community scales and at personal scales. So a lot of what this webinar series is going to talk about is, you know, what people can do themselves, what we can do in both making our home and our immediately built environment more resilient to fire, more um, resistant to fire in some way. So what can we do to the homes that we've built and to the landscaping that we've created around our spaces that provide all those values and functions of home, but are also more able to withstand oncoming um, exposures. So I hope we can think about this issue of how we work on all these dials together so that we can make real actionable change. You know, it's been more than 150 years for the creation of the built environment in California. And I hope that we can modify our environment in a way so that we can allow fire to persist here in a way that doesn't damage us, uh, but is allowed to function in less time than 150 years. So I know that was a bit of a soapbox, but when we think about fixing it, there's a lot of work to be done. So I'm going to bring it back to some real basic concepts. So, and triangles are something I like a lot. Um, and so there's a couple important triangles when it comes to fire. So if you've ever tried to light a fire in a, in a campfire setting or in a wood stove, you know that you need fuel and you need some air to keep, to allow that to work and you need heat to be able to make fire, right? But when you think about fire in the wildland landscape, you know, we know that fire behavior is affected also by having something to burn. Um, having a weather condition that will facilitate the burning, and then topography influences the dynamics of those fire, right? So two triangles all based on a central premise of fuel. So let's drill into that a little bit. And, you know, we've just gone through red flag warnings, so maybe this is super intuitive to you all, but, you know, the weather is something that we can't control, 
but you know it fundamentally affects the condition of fuels. And what I find interesting when you look at these three images here of both oak woodland lit litter and then two images of grasslands, how difficult it can actually be to get both fine fuels to burn. Um, but when you start in the morning, you know, your grasses may be wet from the dew and the moisture of the evening. Um, and then as the sun comes up, that fuel can readily um, lose its humidity and become dry and then become receptive to fire. Right, so it doesn't take very long for some fuels to change. Where the woodier fuels, the bigger, you know, size size materials can take a considerably more um, long time period to to change in their moisture availability. But then you add a little bit of wind, and then you've got the capacity both to continue to dry out the environment as well as to move fire if you have it. And all those pieces come together to create. Um, an opportunity for a red flag warning, which I think we're becoming more prepared and, and understand better that when we're in those red flag conditions that we really need to behave differently and we need to think about our home environments differently so that we can pre protect ourselves the best we can. Now, there's another little piece about this, which is average and extreme weather conditions. And, you know, average conditions are, you know, what was happening before we had that lightning ignition series this summer, where, you know, it was our normal dry time of year, uh, but we still had moistures in our green uh, living vegetation as well as our dry fuels that were carried from the previous wet season. And so in those time periods, you know, we're lucky that our fire professionals are able to get a hold of most fires that start during that time period. But when we move to extreme conditions where we get extreme heat and we get um, intense winds, that's when things really change. And you know, we can debate about climate change and we can debate about how things are setting up. But the point I wanna to bring to you is in those extreme conditions, that's when our systems get overloaded. And that's when we really need to work hard as, as residents of California to be able to help others help ourselves. Uh, because there's a lot that we can do ourselves to prepare um, for wildfire and both create um, safe places if we need them, opportunities for evacuation that are easy and smooth, and perhaps a home that doesn't need to be defended. So when you think about topography, you know, wind is carried up slope. Um, and you always know when you get up on top of the ridge, you know, the ridges have a lot more wind. Well, fire follows those pathways. You can see the um, images from the Tubbs fire on the left where this home um, uh, did, did experience fire and was consumed. And the fire just went right up that canyon, right up to this hill, the top of the hill where this home was built. Intense fuel modifications had been done uh, downslope to protect this uh, condition from happening. but the dynamics were such that the fire was able to be still carried and there were weaknesses in the home that then um, unfortunately left this home vulnerable to fire. So topography is an important consideration where we place our home. So with that, I'd like to um, open it up for a few questions and bring uh, my colleague, Dr. Steve Quarles in and bring Rich back and uh, look forward to starting the evening off. Great. Thanks very much, Jan. I appreciate that. Do let me introduce Steve Quarles here. We heard a little bit about him in the past. We'll be hearing more from him in the future. Thought it'd be good to bring everybody together for a little bit of Q&A here. Um, one of the questions that comes up all the time, what actions are really worth it for a homeowner to take in terms of time and investment? Yeah. yeah. All right. You know what, you guys? You're the best. <laughs> okay. I'll... I'll... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry there. Yeah, I'll start that. I mean, there's a number of things that homeowners can do. I think it's important that that homeowners realize that homes survive because of things that happen on their property in terms of defensible space and things they do to their house itself. Um, the area really close to the house and under the footprint of any attached deck is, is, is important to minimize the amount of combustibles that are there. Um, Yana will talk about that a little bit more a little bit later. And then simple things to the home um, in terms of making it better able to uh, resist embers. This would be cleaning debris out of gutter, cleaning debris off roof, uh, making your near home zone as non-combustible as possible. Um, these kind of things are simple and um, we can talk about more uh, more ex, uh, 
maybe difficult things. And, and I, I should say that we have a couple of, of uh, home hardening webinars scheduled for the future that will go into much more detail on these kind of things. So uh, maybe Yana, you wanna uh, add some more info? Yeah, I think we'll talk a little bit more about it tonight, but I just wanna say that not all of this has to be expensive. And I think everyone needs to make a plan and sort of start checking off the, the elements on the plan. We don't expect everyone to do everything today or tomorrow, but you know, what is your pathway forward and where are the weakest points in your home and where are the things that you can do? I, I mean, my house, for example, was built in 1955. And until last year, I had a 1955 original Redwood shake roof. It was a big investment to, to replace that roof. And I knew that the roof was really the biggest vulnerability I had in my home, but you know, I had to refinance my house to get there. And so, um, you know, we're not asking everyone to get to that stage. And we're talking about a lot of things that are achievable, that are simple, that are low cost. And so it's about making that plan and bringing it into action. Great. Well, thanks to both of you. Um, one question that three people from the audience have asked, and I think it's pertinent to where we are right now, really has to do with kind of with land use planning. And the question generically is, why are we continuing to allow expansion and building of homes into the WUI? And for example, not only are we allowing that, but then after we have a wildfire, what kind of preventive actions are we taking to deal with all of that? I, I could take a, I'm going to take a controversial answer, Rich, and I'm going to give you a curveball. Um, I answer a lot of media questions and people ask me, why in God's good or should we allow people to build back in paradise? And my rhetorical answer is, why do we allow people to build in the southeastern United States in Hurricane Alley and in Tornado Alley. And, you know, why do we do these things? Because we ultimately can figure out how to do things better. And it's a really complicated issue to be able to take away people's private property rights and their ability to um, live in places. And so I think the issue is really about educating folks about what their vulnerabilities are, what their weaknesses are, and trying to figure out how we can amend those. There isn't a part of California that's not vulnerable to fires. Something. Every part of California can burn. And so, um, yes, I think we can use land use and policy and decisions to think about these issues. But when you scale up, there is no immune landscape within California. So the other thing I think Yana would maybe agree with this is, is, is really when you build back the same way, you know, that's sort of uh, odd when, when, when you do that, particularly these days when we know much more about how to build back better. I think those are just great answers. And I think for those who are following this series, this is really what we're getting at, which is how you can build your home in a wild, what, a safe way, defensible space, harden it, lots of actions we can take. And that's <clears throat> really what it's all about. Okay, with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Yana, who's gonna sort of take us to the next step of this. Thanks very much. Very good. Is that working for you all? I want to make sure. Yes. Okay, great. Well, um, so I've got a few more slides here and I just want to, you know, come back to this element of fire behavior and the topography, weather and fuel element and what element can you control? Well, you can, on the topography front, you can choose where you place your home. You can choose where you buy a home. Um, but aside from that, you know, we're, we're limited in a lot of um, confinement based on where our towns and our cities and our communities are. The weather, you know, it's really hard to choose your own weather. I know I, I always want to do that. But the fuel element is the part that each of us can control. And, you know, I just want to scale up to this idea that fuel is anything that will burn. You know, and most commonly we think about it as the trees, shrubs, and the grass. But it can be more broad than that. It can be the mulch we use to control moisture um, and weeds in our, gar in our gardens. It can be our lawn furniture. It can be our cushions on our, on, our, on our furniture as well. It can be elements of our fencing. I mean, look at this picture of the fencing here in paradise. And it could be our decks, our play structures, our arbors, our trellises, our planter boxes, our stored wood piles. Uh, fuel can also be your house. So thinking differently about what fuel is, that it's not just vegetation, um, is I think the art of getting into this topic here. So, 
you know, when it comes to this issue, what I often ask people is what's been holding them back? You know, is it the neighbor's not on board? And so, you know, I'm overwhelmed by the neighbor's condition or, uh, you know, my home has too many problems. I, I don't even know where to start or I need my privacy or, you know, or I love my house just the way it is. Well, I guess I just encourage you to confront each of those issues and think about it. And ultimately, you can't affect your neighbors, but you can affect your own environment. So, um, you know, the small actions matter. And yes, this image here shows a number of issues, but I do think that most of them are manageable and achievable. So coming back to embers, right? Embers are pervasive and they can get anywhere. They can find the nooks and crannies. Uh, my cabin was under evacuation as a result of the August fire. And when I came back, what did I discover? My cabin did survive, but underneath my door into the front of my house was a whole pile of ash. And so I realized that my weather stripping wasn't very good and embers would have been able to get right inside my house um, if I had actually had not just ash, but embers. So embers find those weak spots. And what that means is that um, embers are often responsible for the majority of home ignitions, where in this case, it looks like from the Angora fire that, you know, an alien came in and just sort of zapped that house uh, because none of the vegetation was involved. But really, it was that embers penetrated the home either by uh, the ventilation system, which we'll describe in a little bit more detail in a bit, or by landing on vegetation right next to the home that created an exposure to the home and direct flame contact to the home. Um, so becoming ember aware uh, is, is what we're going to talk a lot about in this webinar series. So fire exposures, I'm going to do a little vocabulary building here. And, you know, I, 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 I'm sorry if it's a little wonky, but you know, most of us have been thinking about direct flame contact. This idea that this like tsunami of flames is going to come at the building that we're in and it's just going to overwhelm the building. And in reality, it can be that the fire is often a long distance away, maybe a mile or more away, and it's sending spots of burning vegetation or elements from other people's homes that are already engaged and that, veget and that um, material is being lofted at our home. And so you don't actually have direct flame contact, but you have these hot embers that are able to find a weakness or create a fire uh, next to the home. So direct flame contact, embers, and now the next piece, radiant heat. Radiant heat is when you have an ignition of maybe your neighbor's building uh, or your own garage that's detached, and the heat from that ignition creates enough heat to break a, a glass window, and then you get um, fire with inside the house. Um, you know, it's kind of like putting your boots by the, by the wood stove. And, you know, it's sometimes if you put the socks there too, you can actually create ignition, right? So being aware of these three types of exposures are what we're going to talk a lot about um, and, you know, are really important for us to drill in. Because when you think about what we've been talking about in California with fire for many decades, um, it's you know, about defensible space, right? This idea that you're going to create a reduced fuel zone that goes out to 100 feet if you happen to be so fortunate to own that much property, where you modify fuel behavior um, such that, um, modify fuel conditions such that the fire will um, calm down and come towards your house. Uh, and that's something you can defend your house uh, against. Uh, you know, and so it involves some, you know, transition, some change in arrangement of either the trees or the shrubs in some way such that fire will, um, fire behavior will change. But what that really means is about creating a defendable space for firefighter um, um, establishment so that you've got fire that might be in the canopies of either the trees or the shrubs. And as it gets that um, modified fuel condition, you know, with a separation between the trees, then the flames come out of the canopy and they get down to a height that you can have um, crews be able to respond to. And that's great. I mean, that's what we need to do in average fire conditions. But in these extreme conditions, uh, or we have a lot of wind, it requires us thinking a little differently because embers can easily pass over that zone and, um, and there's no one there to protect your home. Uh, often in this situation, because there's so much happening simultaneously. So how do we change our thinking to be able to respond to embers? Well, what that really means is um, beginning to employ a new strategy. Instead of working from the, prop, you know, the edge of the property towards the house, flip that around and think about how do you work from the house outwards? And so you'll see um, the 
the usage of a three zone strategy becoming commonplace. And it just became law in California. Uh, Gavin Newsom signed um, a new bill this year that is gonna help us understand the importance of this zone and over time begin to help us create more guidance around this zone. Um, this is not a new concept. It's really become mainstream. Um, the work came about in the early 90s uh, with some of our colleagues over at the University of Nevada, Ed Smith. And you know, since then we've really seen this this concept um, taking take charge both uh, nationally and so you know it's it's really great to see adaptation and thinking more clearly about what type of fire exposures we're going to have so in marin you already see this through fire safe marin um, you know the development of multiple zones but this element of a non-combustible zone or an ember resistant zone around the house and around any attachment and any attached deck so that you've got this extra line of protection around the house so that if embers land there, they don't create an ignition. What I love about Marin is they also have an access zone, which helps you think about how to get ingress and egress, how to come, how to be able to escape a fire and how to get fire um, crews in quickly. And I bet we have some more questions now. All right, we are back. Thanks uh, with Steve and Yana here. Um, one question that comes up a lot is why do we often see homes that have been completely destroyed, but the trees surrounding the homes are still green and look very healthy? It's, it's because of the ignition scenario and it is embers flying over that green vegetation and igniting something on, near, or in the home. Um, often vegetation surrounding a home is damaged from the burning home itself, not from the wildland fire. Um, this is particularly true when you um, in, when you have homes sort of interspersed within vegetation. Um, when you're in a densely packed neighborhood, you know homes can ignite other homes, and it, it can be a slightly different scenario. But the reason why you see living vegetation around homes is because of what Yana indicated in terms of the number one cause of uh, home ignitions and that being embers and how they go about doing their job and, and igniting um, homes. Great, thanks Steve. Um, another question that comes up a lot is zone zero is... So, is you, Rich, 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 you, you froze Rich, can you just... Oh, I'm again? sorry. Um, so zone zero is a kind of a hot topic right now. First five feet around the house. Is it safe to have anything in that area that's flammable? So can we have any vegetation there? Yanni, you can take the first crack at this. Well, this is kind of choose your risk. And it really depends on your setting, it depends on your siding. Um, and I would say, what are you gonna regret after a fire has come through? And uh, I can see from the Q&A questions, you know, is there anything that's not ugly? And I think what we need to do is take a step back uh, and sort of flip flop where we put our sidewalks closer to our houses and we put our garden beds outside the sidewalk zone. Um, and it will provide a lot of benefit for maintenance and for uh, making sure that we don't have extra water on the edges of our houses from the irrigation that comes from from our vegetation that we tend to plant right next to our houses. Uh, there really isn't a fire safe plant list. There aren't plants that aren't capable of burning under the right conditions. So, um, you know, there are no absolutes in, in this world, um, but the more that we can transition and move that vegetation away, the better we can. Because the point is when you have eaves that overhang and you get ignition right next to the house, then you have the creation of more embers and more heat and that can just suck right up underneath our eaves and get inside our ventilation system and inside our attics. Um, I don't know that that's a risk that I want to take. And so, you know, bear with us. I think we're going to do some great work with the UC Master Gardeners in helping vision this. And um, I really do have a lot of optimism about how we can sort of redesign our narrative and still have beauty, still have function, um, and but create greater fire protection. And I, I would just add that you need to really also consider what is on the uh, on the wall very close to the ground. Um, even if you have non-combustible siding, typically you're going to have a part of that wall assembly that hangs over the um, 
the foundation and and um, it could be vulnerable. So you, you may think you're good just because you have non-combustible siding, but that's not necessarily the case. And so when you start walking down the road of having combustible things near your home, you also need to pay particular attention to what's what's on your wall and what's and what's in that wall assembly. We will definitely cover these kind of issues in uh, future webinars. Maybe thanks, Steve and Yana. One maybe one last question related to all this: um, outside storage of flammable things, whether it be firewood or propane tanks, or you know my five gallons of gasoline mm -hmm. and whatnot. There's a lot of questions about: is there a safe way to store that? How far away does it need to be? How's that all supposed to work? Any tips? Uh, f firewood, for example, you know, should be uh, either. 30 feet or so away during fire season, you know, during the dead of winter, you know, it's, it's not that you, you'd want it a little more convenient than that. Um, but you can uh, put some of these things in more uh, uh, fire resistant enclosures. So um, their own special uh, cubby um, that is made of non-combustible materials, for example, um, would be an alternative an alternate. Uh, there's some chat about uh, whether or not we can uh, cover firewood piles with a fire resistant tarp. Um, you know, that's an option. Uh, uh, we at FireSafe Marin will be doing some uh, work on that to provide better guidance uh, to, to you in, in the future. Um, so th th there are things you can do, but you know, the easiest answer is is a way you're not going to do that with your barbecue grill propane tank. So, when wildfire is threatening, you know you need to detach that and and put it in a safer place. Um, that can be far away from the house. You know, if, if your home is set up, it could be inside the house, for example. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Let's get on to the next uh, segment. Okay. Very good. Well. We just have a few more few more concepts to bring forward, and then I think we're going to be able to share some of the um, some of the thoughts about trying to create that future vision. So, you know, just scaling back up to the ten thousand foot view, um, I find it sort of philosophically interesting that uh, we've created an entire service with the name Firefighters, um, but yet when it comes to other uh, you know challenges that we face, such as earthquakes, uh, tornadoes, or hurricanes. You know, we don't have an equivalent service for that, but what do we do? You know, we adapt and we build smarter. And so I guess I challenge you all to think about, you know, we've moved a huge quantum leap when it comes to earthquakes. You know, we strapped down our water tanks. Uh, we're on, um, you know, better foundations. We, we have better design of our buildings. Like, can we do the same thing when it comes to fire? And I guess my answer is yes. So if we can approach the way we've handled earthquakes and in the same way that we can handle fire, then I think we're gonna make great progress. You know, and just a summary here, the majority of homes are ignited from embers. So how do we become more ember aware and how do we become more adapted to be able to withstand embers? There are lots of new um, building codes for California and those are helping when it comes to new construction. And we've seen uh, even in the case of Paradise that homes that were built, uh, you know, since that uh, period of new construction and new codes are, are doing better even in such an extreme fire. So, you know, there's some bright spots there when it comes to it. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to our larger public policy challenges, how do we incentivize upgrades to existing homes? Um, it didn't get funded this year. You know, COVID took the, the dominance of our resources in California. So how do we work together to prioritize this? How do we, um, you know, protect our most vulnerable? These are big philosophical questions, but at the same time, they're also really urgent questions that we need to do to work together. And, you know, what is it going to take to be able to envision that beauty and that future um, that's a place that you want to call home that still has the incorporation of the non-combustible zone as a part of our defensible space strategies? I think we kind of have to let down our guard. I know I fight with my mom about this all the time. She's a prolific gardener and she's not going to ever go there. But let's think about it for a moment. Let's take a step back and, and start to create some new drawings and some new ways to be able to implement fire defensible space in our properties. I think you can do it. So 
you know, a fire smart, a fire wise, whatever we want to term the, the, the modifier of landscape, to me, it's totally possible. And it can include beauty, and it can include safety, and it can include privacy, and it can save water, and it can be pollinator friendly. But really, it's about the right place, the right plant in the right place. Placement is key, and maintenance is absolutely essential. Just because you buy a plant with some kind of label doesn't mean that plant's going to stay that way through time. Think about lavender, for example. It starts out lush, and then in one or two years, that thing is woody and dense, and it's got all kinds of dead material in it, right? So that plant moves in its condition through time. So, you know, kind of erase the issue around labels when it comes to plants and think about where the best place is for that plant that provides the greatest protection for you. And maybe it's a little farther out so you can look out your kitchen window and see it a little better. When it comes to home design, you know, and maintenance and construction, all those are more important than any particular individual fire resistant building product. There's a lot of folks out there trying to sell people things and really it's about all of it. It's a coupled approach that addresses all those pieces together. One building product is not going to save you. Just because you have stucco construction, you know, you have stucco cladding on your, on your house, that's not enough. Just because you have a metal roof, that's not enough. It really uh, involves thinking about the, your building as a system and how it functions together. And poor insulation and lack of maintenance can overwhelm even the best of intentions and increase vulnerabilities in buildings in general. So Steve and I are going to conclude here with looking at a couple of images um, and, you know, trying to create that future vision. So this is a, uh, an example of new construction that attempts to incorporate both the design and the non-combustible zone. Uh, I ran across this building. Uh, it's in Weed, California. It had experienced, um, this region had experienced fire not too many years back. And um, here's uh, one landowner's uh, effort towards trying to build that future construction. And um, I came across it, you know, incomplete. So you'll have to like, you know, think about the vegetation that's going to go into it. But let's let's look at some of the key elements. So, Steve, what strikes you when you look at this um, this home here and the landscaping that's going to be set up around it? Well, it has a great non-combustible zone, um, and we sort of alluded to this earlier. But you can see, um, maybe Yana, you can use your cursor, but this vertical zone. So, in addition to the horizontal five foot zone, you need to also to make sure that you have a non-combustible component vertically because embers that, that uh, are thrown against uh, this home uh, during a wildfire, um, they're gonna hit the wall and go straight down and they're going to, um, some of them will stop right at that uh, ground to wall uh, intersections. Some of them will continue uh, flowing backwards because that's what wind does when it blows against the house. But, but there'll be a large number that just stay put right there. And so you want to make sure that both uh, that the vertical leg and the horizontal leg are non-combustible. And this is a good example of that. Um, you know, I like uh, the, the class A roof. You know, it looks like it's a relatively simple home. There are some valleys, but it doesn't look like they have any um, uh, more complicated roof structure that you need, that you would need to worry about, and and there aren't any. It's a flat roof, so there aren't any uh, openings between the roof covering itself and the, and the roof deck. So you know that's a good feature. Um, what do you? I like here? that. Well, I like how they've got this sort of showcase place uh, where we've got the number two here, where clearly there's going to be some beautiful garden right there. And it's going to, when you're going to walk up to that house, you're going to be greeted by that garden. And it's going to be very clear that this is a place called home, um, but it's out from underneath any of the eaves. It's, it's away from the home. It's, it's well designed. It's thought about from the beginning. Um, think about the mud season too. They've got this really nice, it's, you know, maybe not a full five feet, but they've got you know, this walkway around the garage here. And so, you know, it's well set up from the beginning. They also just done, you know, they've, they've got, um, you know, the siding is, is non-combustible. Um, the, the, you know, the roof line is simple, but they've got a few decorative elements and they've been able to manage that, that uh, in a way that I think, you know, having that exposed wood will not be a problem. Um, you know, I don't know. I just like it. it. It still feels, you know, connected to the landscape, anchored enough, um, and I think it will do a nice job through time. I can't wait to go back and, and see this house and see what it looks like now. This was, I took this about 18 months ago. So one, one thing about that, those columns um, yeah. at the door entry, you could have uh, Here. more space between the ground and the start of, of those columns. Um, embers will lodge um, in that 
small space now. And there are a number of stories of post-fire stories of, uh, of those kind, that kind of detail resulting in, in the ignition of columns and, the, and fire burning up the column. Um, mm -hmm. This is typically a deck story, but you know that would work the same way with with what we what we see here. So um, the strategy there would just to be to create a larger gap, and you can do that with uh, with metal uh, fasteners. That you would have a bolt that would go through the metal fastener through the wood, and then connect uh, through the metal fastener on the other side, and there'd be a bolted connection. Um, that would be a strategy that that would work. Um, there. The other thing I see is this roof line to wall connection here, and this is going to be a maintenance point because it, um, there are pine trees around this house, and you can imagine that those pine needles are going to blow and they're going to lodge and connect right at this roof to wall point. And so we don't know what the flashing was done underneath here, but um, you know some further maintenance is going to be required to to kind of keep that area clean. Um, if any of you have a, you know, a roof to wall connection like this, this is a very vulnerable point in general, and it's possible to do some retrofitting here, put in some more flashing um, that can basically armor that section a little bit more. Because you can imagine that you've got leaf uh, material or needle material accumulated here that embers can ignite that, and all of a sudden you've got exposure against the wall that's not really designed to resist, resist that kind of flame. So, There'll be yeah. a few more things to think about with this home. Nothing's maintenance free, but it's a great for fresh start nonetheless. So in that location, you just want to make sure that the sheathing that you know most California houses have because of earthquake kind of design issues, whether that's exposed or not in that uh, in that roof to wall connection that you're just pointing to. I see one um, Q and A question about the garage door and. I don't know what the garage door is made of, but let me just point, you know, to the fact that newer construction generally you have a tighter garage door, and so you've got less room for things to escape in and around it. Um, but you know, there's some um, things that people can do to basically make this, make both of these connection points uh, more robust and um, resist, you know, penetration by embers because you can easily get um, them penetrating in the inside of your garage. And we have all kinds of things stored in our garage that are quite flammable. So. Um, you know, some things to think about there. Doesn't look like there's gonna be a radiant heat exposure to this door. Um, if, you, if you did have a garage door with a likelihood of radiant heat, then there's, you know, that's an additional thought. Let me show you another house, because I think, um, you know, I wanna, I wanna be mindful of time and make sure we have enough chance for questions here. Um, here's another example. This home is a survivor home. And uh, Steve Quarles and I found this in Paradise. Um, it was uh, set in kind of the older part of Paradise. This is following the 2018 campfire. And you know what was striking about this house <clears throat> is that um, there were, I don't know, 50, 100 homes around it that were all uh, uh, lost to fire. And it, you know, it was kind of the sole survivor in this sea of, of loss. Um, there was fire on the ground. Um, the fire did not go through the crowns of the trees. Um, but, you know, it had caused us to immediately stop and get out and say, what happened here? And so there's some really interesting stories in why we speculate that this home survived. So you want to kick us off, Steve? So it had a lot of good features. It had a really good non-combustible zone. It had, you can notice that it's, uh, you can't really see the horizontal part of it, but you can definitely see the vertical part of it. And that was pretty key all around. It had a, the, the Class A roof. You know, I think Class A roofs are, a dime a dozen these days. Almost everything that that you can uh, buy is Class A, and and the most affordable roofs these days are Class A. So, um, not as hard to find. But th this home also had um, a California, a state office of the state fire marshal approved uh, fire and ember resistant vent, and that's that number two item there. This is one of the four brands of of uh, vents that have been approved by the state fire marshal's office. Um, that provide additional protection because of the flame and ember resistance. Um, it, so, you know, I think those were, uh, it, it has a non-combustible cladding, it's a fiber cement product, um, just a lot of good things. That, that the, your number three item there was, you know, probably the most vulnerable part of the house, and that was this a combustible doormat. Um, um, you it's a little scrap see, of carpeting. That yeah, scrap of carpeting. You can see some, some ember uh, marks on it. Uh, we did some uh, research at IBHS when I was uh, 
the chief scientist there um, uh, a few years ago um, with embryo-ignition potential of various uh, doormat materials. Um, it, it takes a, a, a lot of embers, but you'll also notice uh, on that door mat and this carpet that there's some uh, pine needle debris. And so that would make, uh, make it much easier for embers to, to uh, ignite and get the, the uh, carpet to contribute, let's say. So well, those, and we, are, and we should say that, that yeah, we were here, you know, two and a half weeks after the fire came through. So this leaf material and these needle material came down later um you know so i can see a couple comments about you know this maybe isn't people's ideal construction home but one of the things to think about so this is a situation where an older home went through some type of upgrading and then the new construction codes kicked in and so they modified and retrofitted this home that's why you see these new embers i mean these new vents here um, this, the way this is both ember and flame resistant is it actually has an aluminum um, kind of honeycomb mesh in it. And as you know, aluminum has a low melting point. So if you get flame um, pushing on that vent, that aluminum melts and shuts down the vent. So, or it kind of oozes and so it, you know, shuts down the vent such that you don't get air exchange in it. It means that it won't service again, uh, but you need to replace it. But it's, um, kind of this new system. There are other uh, vents that meet um, Chapter 7A construction standards for both flame and ember resistance, and they look different, but this is one style um, just to, to, to illustrate. I'll let you, Steve, come in in just a second. Let me, let me just say a couple other things that were interesting to me. Um, the roof, you know, was upgraded and new, and uh, there, were, um, there was evidence of fire in the gutters. And so we could see burn lines on these gutters. Um, and so there have been enough needle material that had come down and we had ignition in those gutters, but there were a couple other details that made it so even though there was ignition in the gutters, it didn't go underneath the roof plane um, and get inside the roof because there was some flashing that is all standard and is a standard course now. But if you have an older home, maybe you don't quite have that flashing. The other thing that we saw was that the garage, which I don't show pictured here, was right next to it, and the garage didn't hit the upgrade. So it had still single pane aluminum windows, and there was a line of uh, junipers that were within, I don't know, four or five feet next to that garage. Those junipers ignited, and there was enough radiant heat exposure from those junipers that it broke the glass uh, into the garage. Now, ordinarily, I would think that the garage uh, would have failed as a result of that, or, or we would have had ignition in it. But in fact, what happened is that uh, the windows broke and um, there were probably embers that were cast inside, but this home happened to be for sale. And so as a result, there was no material, nobody had stored anything. The home and the garage were empty. And so the collected stuff that is all part of our life, which is also fuel, was not present. And so that probably had another contributing factor uh, to the survival of this home. So it's an older style home. It went through some modifications and all those things set it up for success. And so, you know, these are not expensive um, changes, but they really made a difference in this home. I just want to make one. To oh, I just wanted to, to to make some one modification about about the uh, the vent. It is an aluminum honeycomb um, mesh that you see. It it is coated with uh, um, intumescent paint, and it's the intumescent okay. paint that that uh, responds to heat and swells up several times its thickness and closes uh, those openings. So. You you will not use it again. You will replace the vent, but but it's intumescent coating. So this particular uh, brand is called Vulcan. Uh, there are three other uh, state fire marshal approved uh, vents. It was one is called another is called Brand Guard, another is called Embers Out, and then uh, there's O'Hagan. O'Hagan only makes through roof vents, but um, Brand Guard. Uh, this Vulcan and Embers out, they make uh, vents that could be um, almost any location on the home. This is a crawl space vent that we're looking at here, but the same design feature, for example, can be used in an under eave area, it can be used in the gable uh, end vent, it can be used in certain through roof kind of vent designs, but it's the intumescent paint that, may, that gives this particular vent its flame resistance. 
and we don't uh, promote one type of event over another, but they're they're all interesting, and they're um, each of these companies have events that fit in all of our different situations, even the little circular, you know, under E events that that you might see. So they're all available. I did see a question. Yes, this home did sell. Um, I did drive by it uh, just this this uh, summer, and there's a a nice family in there, and I'm sure they're quite happy to to not have to to rebuild, um, but they they have a story to tell. So in bringing it all together and in kind of our last slide, you know, how do we think about prioritization around these issues? And, you know, as you're probably getting a sense that there is no simple formula when it comes down to this. And so people always ask us, you know, where do you start? How do you think about this issue? So we're going to talk about um, a couple of considerations. So in the simple formula where you're like me and I live in, um, kind of in a suburban setting where I'm on a large lot and my neighboring buildings are more than 30 feet away, my highest priority is my roof and my roof edge. And you all know that I finally am no longer um, humiliated because I don't have a redwood roof anymore. So I can actually come out in, in the daylight and be thankful and say that I'm, <laughs> I'm doing well here. The next priority is the vents in the home, and those are the foundation, the under eaves, the through roof fence. And one of the issues is that most of the vents that are in common uh, manufacturing and in common installation have a large mesh screen size. Uh, and so they're large enough that they allow good air exchange, uh, but they're also vulnerable to embers, and embers can enter and pass through that screen size. So um, either upgrading the screen size in the in the low cost approach or moving to uh, a situation where you install some of these new vents that are out that also shut down um, and when they're exposed to flames or just don't allow flame to penetrate is kind of the the next best piece so and then upgrading we in terms of making it finer mesh making it finer mesh so moving from quarter inch mesh to one uh, eighth inch or finer mesh um, and then this element of defensible space and vegetation modification. So that zone zero that we're talking about, the roof, the vents, and zone zero, those are the highest priorities that people need to be thinking about in a setting like mine where um, you know, the buildings are far away. And that's because embers can easily ignite uh, near home, near to home vegetation and debris or, or penetrate those vents or you know, something along that line. Then as you start to you know, work through your list, then the next sets of priorities are looking at the deck, the windows and the siding um, because of the potential that you know, my garage ignites in this situation and then I have a radiant heat exposure or um, you know, there's some more complicated ways that direct flame contact can come to the house. Uh, so it's not about siding. You see we're siding, siding's a little lower on the list here. You know, it's really starting at the roof thinking about how to upgrade those vents so that they don't become penetrated by embers and then, you know, installing that, that line of additional protection of zone zero and then emanating out from the house. However, the situation gets more complicated when you're on a steep slope or you're in a neighborhood where homes are closer together. So Steve, why don't you describe those situations and, and what people need to be thinking about there? So, yeah, I, I think, uh, thanks, Jana. Um, I think it's important that people kind of understand where they are in the scheme of things in terms of their particular scenario. And it will help, I think, uh, determine your priorities. So you can think of, uh, of uh, the, the two that we show here is your house is on a steep slope. You know, your, your concern there is fire burning up slope, getting under the deck, igniting the home in that way. Um, the embers, you every home will have to resist embers. And so there's a certain number of things you can do there. If you're in a neighborhood where your neighboring home, a, a neighbor's home is 30 feet or less away, um, then your neighbor's home can be your, your threat. Um, so whereas we don't talk about siding as being that important, it's really not that important if all you only need to worry about are embers because there are things you can do to reduce the vulnerability of your home from a siding perspective um, if you only have to worry about embers. If you have to worry about extended radiant heat or flame contact that might come should your neighbor be close by, then siding becomes important and, and uh, the kind of material that your siding is made out of is important. So 
as are windows. And so where you, you might want to consider um, replacing siding in that situation or having a really good conversation with your neighbor so that you know they're on the same page as you and and you do things to your homes to for each home to resist ignition. We talk about a community or neighborhood-wide approach. You know, this is to to keep all neighboring homes from uh, igniting, and therefore, it is just an ember thing, and it isn't uh, a radiant heat that that one needs to worry about. Um, we, there's a lot published on, on uh, home hardening kind of things, if we want to use that term. Um, and as I indicated before, we have a couple of, uh, of uh, additional webinars coming up that will talk in much more detail about, about these kind of issues and, and other things that can be done in much more detail. And so, you know, that detail is where, you know, where the fun starts and there are a lot of, you know, achievable and manageable strategies for, for each of these, these issues. So, um, you know, sort of thinking them through is, is the fun part. Um, each of the, the, you know, coming webinars is going to drill into some of these topics in, in greater detail. There are resources on FireSafe Marin's uh, website. There's also resources on University of California and, and Fire. Uh, websites and um, you know we look forward to helping you think through these issues and and be available to to help other communities you know talk through each of these specifics. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I think there's some great questions that are coming through the Q and A about how do you harden under decks, um, a gutters and gutter guards, and those types of things. Um, and so you know, Rich, I'll let it you know leave it to you as to whether or not you want to take those questions on, but I think they're, they're good and worthwhile. Can I, Great. Can I, I think we can just kind of flow into um, what we usually think of as our overtime question and answer, because there are still some great questions coming through all related to the topics Did you have. Steve, did you want to say something first? Well, there's a question I don't see anymore that I thought I, I could answer quickly, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. So there was a question about, uh, it was this um, about event and, and embers passing through and, and how, how can that happen so quickly? Can, can, can that vent swell up, you know, close so quickly to, pre pre to prevent ember passage? And I just wanted to, to make one clarification is that, that is that these vent manufacturers typically have uh, different design features. One design feature is for the flame part. Another design feature is for the ember part. So almost all of these um, um, vent manufacturers use screening for the ember part, and they use something else for the flame part. So for the flame part, Vulcan uses um, intumescent uh, paint. Brandguard uses an intumescent strip and um, and they and it's a baffle design that makes things turn a lot of corners. Um, so they use some sort of ob obstruction to 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 minimize flame penetration. So there's, I just that that wasn't quite clear in my response, and and I saw the answer, the question, so I thought I would try to clarify that. Great, thanks, Steve. Um, another sort of related to that is the issue comes up all the time about is there something recommended as a really good gutter guard? So um, there um, isn't uh, an uh, uh, independent way to, 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 to evaluate how well a gutter guard works. So we would say use a non-combustible gutter guard as opposed to a plastic one because often uh, debris accumulates on top of the gutter guard or on the roof and back of the gutter guard. Um, so there's not a way to evaluate, so, and so you don't don't have really a third party way to to pick them. We say pick one that is non combustible, um, and then you need to monitor the situation. It is uh, maybe a, a maintenance reducer, but it is not a maintenance eliminator. So you need to keep keep your eye on that area, uh, remove debris where it accumulates, and just make sure. You know, if, if, it, if it accumulates in back of, of, the, of the gutter, then you need to remove that. But I would argue that um, 
that the debris on a class A roof is a far better place for it to be than in the gutter because the gutter ignite debris in, it, in a gutter will impinge on the edge of the roof, not the roof itself. And so the edge of the roof is not class A. Great. Well, Thank and you. then some of the manufacturers talk a lot about um, differences in slope of your roof and different kinds of products based on slope. So think about that. Um, think about how, how you'll maintain it through time, how you install it. Um, I know the ones that my mom has, um, coming back to my mom, every time I try and clean them, I cut my fingers. Uh, so there's some additional issues there. So there's an ease of use issue. Um, I am excited about um, putting gutter guards. And now that I have new gutters, I don't have redwood gutters anymore. I've got nice aluminum gutters. So I'll be uh, entering the adventure soon and have something to share personally about my own experience. <laughs> Great, it's a, it's a pain for all the people who mm -hmm. have uh, the trees in the backyard, mm -hmm. but it is, it is really a critical thing to deal with. Another really frequent topic comes to uh, protecting decks, under decks, on top of decks, all over decks. Any thoughts on decks? I have a lot of thoughts on decks. Um, um, we know a lot about decks, much more than we knew a few years ago. So you uh, you take care of the so, so you take care of the under part of the deck by by removing combustible materials from the under part of the deck. Um, I just recorded a, a, a deck video for Fire Safe Marin. You can go there and and get a a much more detailed response on that. It's on the firesafemarin.org website. Um, but from an ember perspective, the below part of the deck is the deck board gap on top of joists. And so if you clean debris from the middle, from that area, which that's where debris will accumulate also, you're, you're better off. Um, you can um, um, replace the deck board right next to your house and replace it with a non-combustible option, whether that be a metal grate or a metal deck board, which are available these days. That's a less expensive option than, um, you know, than replacing your entire deck. Um, if you are replacing your entire deck, then, then there are other things you can do um, in terms of uh, selection of joist material or a, a covering for the joist that that makes the joist less vulnerable to to embers. Um, maybe that's enough for now. I would suggest going to firesafemarin.org, watch the video, um, give us an email if you have any follow-on questions. Yeah, Steve has prepared two fantastic videos that you can see on the Firesafe Marin web uh, YouTube channel. So definitely worth watching those, they're really good. Um, another issue that comes up from a lot of people is a concern that the real threat of fire in Marin County is not at the home, it's, it's in the open spaces. And that's where we really should be putting all of our attention. That's what we should worry about. Not much that we really should be worrying about around our own house. What do you guys think about that? Well, I think I tried to to key into this issue in the beginning because you know it's easy to kvetch about your neighbors. It's easy to kvetch about a city or a municipality, um, and you know I encourage people to be active, you know, within their communities, active within their public spaces, and talk about these issues. But ultimately, um, what you can control is right around your home, and often the conditions right around your home are really going to be the contributing factors to the survival of your home. So, I guess I'd lead by example, and I'd start at home and try and emanate out the work into your community, and then together you'll have more uh, chance to be more. Um, compelling when you start scaling up and working with your communities. Everybody wants to do something. I mean, I, I'm a land manager and, you know, I always want to be able to manage these issues, but there's so many constraints and there's so many requirements by the public in terms of what you can't do. But I think collectively, we really need to start thinking about what do we want our landscapes to look like? What does resilience look like in these landscapes? And it's not going to be the same in every, in every nook and cranny of these landscapes, but um, you know, we're going to have to scale up and try and figure out what we do want because we spent a lot of time talking about what we don't want. And so, you know, start at home and then let's also have some broader community conversations about what does health look like? What does, you know, resilience to fire look like? And be more, you know, targeted and specific about what that is so that we can help land managers be able to implement those actions. 
Great, thanks. Um, uh, are solar panels a, uh, a problem in terms of the fire numbers? So there has been a fair number of studies on, on uh, solar panels and how they can be vulnerable. Solar panels are vulnerable if uh, debris gets under them and, and that debris is ignited by embers. Then, because the underside of solar, solar panels are plastic and you can uh, have a pretty big fire should that occur. So the, the, uh, the challenge or the, the goal that with um, solar panels on your roof is to minimize the accumulation of debris under them. Um, if you're on a slopey roof, you know, that I haven't seen so much in terms of that accumulation. If you're on a flat roof, you can accumulate a lot of debris. And so you just wanna make sure that you routinely, regularly re remove debris um, in the vicinity of solar panels and on, in, in the vicinity of your roof is always a good idea, but it can be a bigger deal uh, should that ignited debris ignite solar panels. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think you've kind of answered this, but if home harding is sometimes perceived to be expensive, but obviously there are some relatively inexpensive actions that we can take. Once again, kind of what's your priorities on that? So I, I think you should um, look at your home in terms of its scenario, similar to that last slide that we showed. Um, and think about um, your home in terms of the likely exposures that it's gonna see. So they're gonna see an ember. Sh should your home be threatened by wildland fire, it will see embers. And so it has to be able to resist embers. So you wanna make your home resistant to ember ignition. These typically are not expensive things. Um, they are adding flashing, uh, re uh, incorporating or developing this non-combustible zone um, I think we acknowledge that uh, doing things to an existing home can be more problematic and, and more expensive than doing the same thing to a brand new home. Um, but if all you're worried about are embers, then, then um, you know, it, it's, it's a lighter lift. Having your home only worry about embers means that you have done an effective job in developing and maintaining your defensible space in terms of where you put vegetation, how you maintain it. Um, I think if, if your neighbor's really close by, you need to have that conversation. Um, there are things you can do locally um, that can minimize costs. Um, you know, I, I don't wanna keep going back to these upcoming webinars, but, but um, there are, not everything has to be expensive. I was involved with um, a, pa a paper that evaluated the cost of construction. This was, uh, you may have seen it, it's the Headwaters uh, economics paper that came out about a year ago in the summer. Um, so I was a co-author on that. And, and we looked at the cost of construction and it doesn't have to be more expensive when you start new. Uh, but we acknowledge in that document that that is, it's just always more expensive to do something to an existing home. Um, but if you look at your scenario, I think it, you can, you can um, help uh, decide where, where first to go. So there's a lot of things you can do on a, on a weekend that are part of your, your sweat labor and you can get your family together. And, and I think that's one of the things that I'm trying to get people to think about is that this isn't something we deal with just in the summer dry months or when when you know we're in red flag conditions this is something as a whole family that we need to prioritize and strategize about and you know bring to the dinner time conversation it's you know it's your go bag it's your activity plan it's your contact list but it's also like you know how do we protect this this family home and um what can we do as a family to support that so you know maybe it's taking on the front of the house uh, one year um, and, and working on a new landscaping plan and, and getting there and then working our way around the house. Uh, maybe it's temporarily adding some finer mesh to the existing vents we have as, as an interim strategy until, uh, you know, that's 
that's a couple bucks worth of insulation and some, and, uh, you know, a staple gun for the most part and a ladder, right? Um, that's, you know, not hard to do unless, you know, you're in an age gr- group that you shouldn't be up on a ladder. Well, then you should get your sonny to, to come in and help you or, you know, the neighbor down the street to, to be available for you. Um, then when it comes to the deck, you know, maybe your deck is aging. So let's figure out some of the new design details that'll that'll make it um, better for your future deck. And, you know, those don't have to be expensive. They're really um, subtle and small distinctions in terms of insulation that can make a difference. You know, it, and, and when it's come time to replace your roof, you really don't need to do anything new that meets the current construction standards for roofing. So um, if you have an older roof, you just pay attention to it and, you know, walk that roof and put a little bit of, you know, tender loving care into it. And, um, you know, be aware where all those gaps and joints are in places that you get leaf material accumulate and, you know, make sure that you're not going to, if you get an ignition there, it's not going to get inside and underneath the decking of the roof. So, you know, just becoming aware of the different types of exposures. And if you're hiring a contractor, make sure they understand what you're talking about. Um, because this is kind, this is really cutting edge stuff and new, and new stuff for most contractors. And so they're going to love working with a, with a landowner that's, um, that's ready to meet you together. And then you can sort of be able to, you know, brag about their work and, and, you know, all of it will, will result in a, in a better product for everybody. So I should say that FireSafe Marin lists on the FireSafeMarin.org website contractors that have um, participated or sat through um, the landscaping and home hardening um, sort of half day uh, seminars that are workshops that that were given um, about a year or so ago so you can you can find some comfort and some information on on people that that do know a little bit about what they are trying to help you do um a lot of homes in marin were built with uh single pane windows and some of them are really pretty large is there anything that can be done other than replacing them? You can, um, well, I mean, the things you can do besides replacing them is to make uh, a, a shutter that you can um, deploy or, uh, or put up sh- when wildfire threatens. And, and so that can be a thin piece of plywood, say quarter inch. You ju- you just want to protect the glass from the heat, from radiant heat. So you might damage the plywood, um, but that that would pr- protect the window. The, there are shutter systems that you can get that would be metal that would sort of come down. You could activate it and it would deploy. Um, you know that's not going to be inexpensive, so um, you might be better um, replacing the window. And with current energy code you can if you have a large window you, you know replacing your window can help you with your energy bill also and then you know so getting going to a dual pane window and the upcharge would be going to tempered glass in that window uh, chapter 7a forces that tempered glass uh, up up charge but um you know if you have an old old home you may not have to do that, but dual pane is definitely a better way to go from energy and for fire. But if you don't want to do that, then make yourself a shutter and you just have to be able to uh, install it when, when needed. A lot of older Eichler homes in Marin and um, they have a big uh, sort of atrium in the middle that's open, which seems like a perfect place for embers and whatnot to accumulate. Anything that we could recommend in a situation like that? Can I tag on to the previous question? Because I replaced all the windows in my house, in my 1955 house. And, and I went into it with this idea that it was going to be ridiculously expensive. And I had a lot of big plate glass windows. And I will say, really, what drives window costs is uh, whether or not they operate and open, um, whether you, you know, have a very fancy you know, wood detail and finish. Um, but those big plate glass windows are remarkably inexpensive. Um, my casement windows were more, my small three by three casement windows were more expensive than my big plate glass windows. So, you know, actually talk to some folks about the pricing of windows. I, I've been blown away by how inexpensive windows really are for, for modern need. And, you know, in my own home, boy, did my quality of life improve significantly from getting rid of those single pane windows to double pane windows. So, you know, maybe don't look at it, you know, with so much, so much trepidation, uh, you might be pleasantly surprised. And, and the building code has made uh, the supply of tempered glass um, 
go down. I mean, the, the supply go up and, and because demand went up mm -hmm. and, and that has uh, resulted in, in reduced cost for tempered glass. Um, your eye color home question, um, you know, the, the wind blow numbers are gonna be uh, blowing all over the place, the outside perimeter, as well as getting inside. And so you just, you wanna treat that portion the way you would the outside. Um, you can have ember accumulation at the base of a wall. You might have a lot of vegetation plants and, and, and planters in that in interior atrium area. Um, just be careful about what you have, where you put it, because numbers are gonna get in there. All right, I think we have one last question here for the evening, and that is, uh, are you aware of any grants from the state that helps with this, this home hardening? Yana, you're more plugged into that, I think. You know, at this point, it really hasn't um, been able to be delivered. I think it's gonna take some creative solutions. Um, in, the, in the state budget this last year, priorities were redirected towards um, trying to be able to respond to COVID. And um, what we need is some state matching funds to be able to go after some FEMA dollars uh, to, to work in this space. There's some complications there, but you know, I think really it's about gaining broader awareness around these issues and you know we're going to have some difficult conversations about um, is the investment in one home in one community going to make a difference so you know how do we saturate a community you know how do we get to a point where we're really making significant difference and you know i've been thinking a lot about energy efficiency and you know these um, earthquake related retrofits and really when those ideas became mainstream is when we started to realize that it really improves our quality of life, either in our homes from the energy retrofit side or lowered our costs overall, or just became so much of a, of a financial uh, benefit that it was worth managing the investment uh, for, you know, staying off the risk of earthquakes, for example. So, um, you know, I think the more we mainstream these ideas, some of the costs are going to come down to some of the materials and we'll be able to, to figure this out. I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that there can be some state and federal resources to help, you know, those that are most at risk and those are most vulnerable. Um, but I think the rest of it is going to have to get incorporated into our standard maintenance practices and just to living in California with the kind of exposures we have, um, you know, and develop a plan, manage it through time. Don't take everything on in one year, you know, take it on bit by bit. And I've been encouraging folks like, why don't we work on vents this year? Um, you know, we all have things that we want to want to achieve in our home. And I think, you know, events, at least with the upgrading of the screen, uh, you know, that's a few dollars and a little bit of time to work on vents and work on that, um, you know, getting the, the fuels away from right around the house, including the vegetation. All right. Well, I really want to thank Steve and Yana so much. It was just, you know, a great presentation. We really appreciate it. As they both have pointed out, we have a lot more uh, five more webinars coming up related to these topics of combination of home hardening, defensible space, far smart landscaping. I really hope you'll be able to tune in and check those out. You can find the schedule for all of that on the Fire Safe Marin website. And as you've heard many times today, I really do encourage you to go to the website. There's a ton of information on there about all these issues we're talking about. Our YouTube channel has a lot of videos on Decks, fire smart landscaping, zone zero, you name it. And then, of course, you can always write questions to us and we'll follow up with you, uh, try to point you in the right direction or help, help you out with your concerns. So, with that, I bid you all good night and thank you very much. And again, thank you so much for all of you for staying with us. And again, to Steve and Yana for help putting this all together. Thank, thank you. Man. We'll see you thank next you month. All. Good night, everyone.